Welcome to Astro Academy Principia. Featuring astronaut Tim Peake on board the International Space Station, Sophie Allen on the ground in the experiment room, and myself, Anu Ojar, at the National Space Academy. In 2015, European Space Agency astronaut Tim Peake launched from Kazakhstan on a six-month mission to the International Space Station, or ISS. Assembled in low Earth orbit on over 40 separate missions since 1998, the ISS program is the largest international space project in history. With solar arrays spanning the size of a football field and a mass of nearly 500 tonnes, the ISS is humanity's science outpost in space. The onboard crew of six astronauts and cosmonauts take advantage of the unique environment and facilities on board to conduct scientific experiments for researchers across the world. Experiments that are giving us new insights into many different areas of physics, chemistry, biology and engineering and which are also teaching us the essential lessons we need to learn if humans are to ever set out on voyages of exploration. Voyages to other planets in the solar system. But how far do we have to go to reach space? The answer is surprising. Space is much closer to us than we might think. It's actually only 100 kilometres away. That's 62 miles from where I'm standing right now. The problem is, it's 100 kilometres straight up. And if we want to get there, we have to battle against the force of gravity. Gravity is a force of attraction that's created by mass and exerted on other masses. And it's a force that depends on how much mass we have and how far apart those masses are. For me, standing here with a mass of around 90 kilograms, the gravitational force of attraction from that car over there is tiny, less than a ten thousandth of a newton. And every other object around me is also pulling at me with its own tiny gravitational tug. Now, these minuscule forces of attraction from all of these objects surrounding me, they all tend to cancel out, leaving the one force that I can definitely notice, the force that's caused by the entire mass of the Earth pulling downwards on me, the force that I think of as my weight. Over 300 years ago, Sir Isaac Newton showed that gravitational forces actually go on forever following an inverse square law, with a strength that diminishes with distance, but never completely disappears. But if gravitational forces extend to infinity, how does the ISS stay in orbit? And why does everything on board the ISS appear to float? To explain this conundrum, I'm going to use a tennis ball and a biscuit. Newton's first law of motion states that if no overall or resultant force acts on an object, then it will keep moving in a straight line with a constant speed. So here on Earth, if I throw the ball, and if there was no gravitational field at all, then the ball would keep going at a constant speed in a straight line. But of course, it doesn't do that. Instead, Gravity pulls it downwards, and the end result is that the ball follows this curved path that we call a parabola. Now, the faster I throw the ball, the further it travels before it hits the ground. But each time I do so, its path is clearly still a parabola. But the Earth isn't flat. Its surface is curved. So imagine I throw the ball horizontally at an incredibly high speed. Now, the faster the ball is thrown, the greater the distance will be on the Earth's surface before the ball's path intersects the surface of the Earth. And if we could fire the ball horizontally fast enough, then the Earth's surface would curve away from the path of the ball at the same rate as the ball's path was curving downwards. The ball's path would never intersect the surface. Instead, 
the ball would keep following its path on an orbit that would take it around the entire Earth. So it stays in orbit with no extra energy needed. Now the speed needed to complete an orbit depends on the altitude of the orbit. And for the ISS, 400 kilometers up, that speed is nearly eight kilometers every second. A speed that would get us from London to Paris in less than a minute. But why does everything on board seem to float? Well, Newton's equation predicts that at the orbital altitude of the ISS, the Earth's gravity field strength is around 90% of what it is here on the surface. So to explain the weightlessness, we need to remember another discovery of Newton's. That gravitational fields accelerate all masses equally. If I were to only consider the effects of gravity, then if I fired this tennis ball and this much less massive biscuit at exactly the same speed and exactly the same launch angles as each other, then they would both follow exactly the same parabolic paths in Earth's gravity field. Now, if the biscuit were inside the tennis ball, then if I fire the ball, the biscuit, following exactly the same parabolic path, would seem to float inside the tennis ball and with no relative motion between it and the ball. From the biscuit's point of view, it would seem to be floating inside the ball and with no sensation of weight or gravity. But in fact, both biscuit and ball would be on a free fall path falling in Earth's gravity field. Replace the biscuit and the ball with astronauts on board the ISS and we can see how, even though the station is falling on an orbital path deep within Earth's gravity field, the sensation is as if there were no gravitational forces present. We call this apparent weightlessness microgravity, and it's the reason why the ISS is so valuable for scientific investigations. Physical and biological systems often behave very differently in microgravity, and the results of ISS experiments are giving us new insights into our understanding of many research fields. And understanding better the effects of long-term microgravity exposure on the human body, the effect on muscle mass, bone density, and many other physiological areas, is going to be critical on missions where the crew are exposed to microgravity for many months. And so the scientific lessons learned from the ISS will be essential for the next giant leaps that humanity takes. Returning to the moon once more, visiting near-Earth asteroids, and ultimately, perhaps, a human voyage to the planet Mars.